Okay, guys, let's get back on track. Let's let's finish this baby up here. Only got so much battery. Okay, I'm gonna read First John three verses sixteen and following again. Get your minds right. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? We'll just stop right there. If anybody sees his brother in need, but has got material possessions, your brother's in need, and you don't have pity on him, how can the love of God be in you? Are luxuries evil? No. Yes. Most of the time. Sometimes I, it's we live in the time. No, 100% of the time. No. Okay. They aren't sick, okay. but they could be. But they could be. They can cause us to stumble. Here you go. Here you go. <laughs> luxuries are not sin unless, unless you have a brother in need. If you have a brother in need, you indulging in your stuff while he is in need, how can the love of God be in you? Steve? This is a random thought. Um, I remember hearing a report from Europe that some of the uh, majestic uh, cathedrals that they have, where it's, uh, it's almost a work of art, as well as probably cost fortune, I guess. But it is one of the things that is still pointing people do something greater than, than life here is pointing them to God in, in a sense. I, I don't know what you thought of something like that. But what is the picture? Uh, that it, it's a picture of beauty in the truest sense where you see God through. I love beauty in the true sense when I see God through it. <laughs> I'm not tracking with you at all. I guess the, 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 the churches, though, they cost a fortune to make. You know, okay. You, you could think that the, it might be like, well, maybe a, there's a lot of poor people that... I got you. Like mega churches. I got you. America, I got right? you. We're so going to talk about that here in just a second. Okay. Yes, sir. Um...
shelters, and there's Mission of Hope, and da da da. Um, so, but I see this lady on Collins Road every once in a while. She's sitting with her with her cane or with her or with her walker or something, and she looks like the hunchback of Notre Dame. She, sometimes she wears different outfits, it's like, well, this, sh you know, I've heard um, from some people who have advised me. Well, ask her out if she has social security insurance. Does she get help from the government? Does she right. have family? Does she have friends? And I don't know how to deal with that because, like, I do, but it hurts me because I want to give and, but I don't want to be taken advantage of at the same time. But then when you're talking about this, it's just kind of all playing yeah. out. So let me say uh, one statement. One, we're not going to dive into all of that, but I'll just say this for today's discussion. Um, I think that that is a very valid thing to be thinking about, and honestly, our consciences, we need to be, um, huh? In tune. We need to be in tune with our consciences on that. One, I will say this, you are never, you're not going to get to heaven and God's going to go, why did you give money to that poor person? Shame on you. You should have known that they were going to spend it on a prostitute. How are you supposed to know that? You are never going to be punished for giving to anyone who has a need. However, it is also, if we're to be wise stewards with our money, it is good for us to be very aware of all the needs and where our heart points, where our conscience points, like, I want to give to this. I know there's going to be fruit here, so I'm going to give to that. That's all I'll say about that. Josh? So, I wanted to make a point of kind of line To me, the hardest part about all this, like if, if you were if you're standing up here and gave us biblical proof demanding that we all go sell our stuff right now, the hardest part to me, and I don't really care for luxury that much. I mean, I like the nice shoes, but preach. This is kind of the hardest aspect of it is that if. Giving in general is just so against American culture. Like there's just so many different stigmas. Is that a word over there? Stigma. 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 <laughs> anyway, like, against giving to people, like what Hannah pointed out, and also just like that wealth should be something one acquired. And even when you're trying to give to someone, people can. You know, there's a stigma against receiving um, gifts that, like, I don't need your charity. Well, are you trying to say something about me that I'm lazy or something? They won't receive your gifts. Uh, I think, I think, even in our American culture, we view it as kind of like it's not a blessing to give something to someone; it's a curse. A like, burden. You hate them because you give stuff to them. Maybe it's not quite that severe, but it's seen as like it's a bad thing to give things. Right. Uh, yeah, giant. Uh, so, are we commanded if we have luxury items and we see a brother in need, but we don't have money to support them or help them, or like have an item to support them, are we commanded to sell our luxuries and give them that money that we got from our luxuries? May the God of Heaven bless our consciences in this area. I'll say about that. Ben? Um, I just wanted to point out that the passage in First John that we read applies to Christian brothers in need. Amen. Not necessarily to... Amen, Jayden? Yes, sir. Bam! <laughs> <laughs> Bam! Right? Yeah. That's what Jayden was talking about. There's more evidence. Bam! Bam! Okay. Bam. Bam. Alright, now. Okay. So. John Wesley. Have you heard of John Wesley? Great revival preacher a couple, years, a couple hundred years ago. You're... Couple years ago. John Wesley, you can read in John Wesley's biography. In John Wesley's biography, not an autobiography, a biography, not written by himself, written by somebody else, tells a story of when John Wesley was at Oxford going to uh, school, getting his education for ministry. He was at Oxford, he was in his dorm, and he had just gone out, went to the store, and he bought some lovely pictures for his dorm room. He wanted to decorate it. He wanted to, you know, make it feel homey and whatever. 
he's hanging his pictures on his dorm room wall, and there's a knock on the door. And it's one of the maids that worked at Oxford, and she had no money. She had been through some trial. All she had was this thin little nightgown that she was wearing, and she was stuck on the street. And, and John Wesley had no money to give her. And his quote, here's what he says. He says, Are not these pictures the blood of this poor maid? Are not these pictures the blood of this poor maid? Um, now, are buying pictures for your wall inherently bad? Wait, what, is, what did you mean by the blood? Like, yeah. Yeah. As in, like, murder? Okay. <laughs> Pain of the woman, yeah. Uh, was John Wesley the one that had like a fixed amount that he said he was going to live on, and then whenever he got more money than that, he gave it away? Yes, we'll get to that. So, Luke 10, 29, and following. Um, I'm not going to read it all, but somebody asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? He replies, love the Lord with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. And then this guy got real smart, like, who's my neighbor? That's To me, that's a very interesting question, but right after that, it's a good Samaritan story. And it basically finishes with, uh, which of these proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands, and he said, the one who showed mercy towards him, and Jesus says, go and do the same. So, I mean... Good Samaritan is definitely a story of charity to an outsider that is not considered a brother, that's considered an enemy. Uh, Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Samaritans were half-breeds. They were half-Jews. They weren't full-blooded Jews. Jews did not. When Jews would go from Judea up to <coughs> there, they would go around <laughs> Samaria. They would not go through. No Jews would go through Samaria. They'd go around it. Don't even associate with them. So the story of the Good Samaritan is, yeah, you. it's not just give to your brother, it's give to everyone. But um, Okay, so... Yeah, John Wesley. I'll tell you his story here um, when it comes to finances. John Wesley, uh, when he was at Oxford, he was making 28 pounds a year. Okay, English monetary note. 28 pounds a year. And that's all he had to live on. Now, uh, excuse me, he made 30. He made 30 pounds a year, and he took 28 to live on. So he gave the other two pounds away. He graduates, gets a job, now he's making 60 pounds a year. He knows it only takes 28 to live on. This is the, this is the story from the, the pictures on the wall and the maid, the conviction that he gained from that. So he's making 60 pounds a year. He decides to live on 28 and give away 32. Shortly thereafter, he's making 90 pounds and then 120 pounds, and he's living on 28 and giving the rest away. Um... At one point, he was making 1,400 pounds a year. He was living on 30. He was living on 30 pounds a year, giving away the other 1,370 pounds. If you equate that to today's money, he was making $160,000 a year, and he was living on 20000 That's epic. That's just epic. The quote from him is, or in, in his book, it, it is said he was afraid to store up treasures here. I think we ought to be too. There's reason for us to be afraid of that. Um, so let's do some application here. Uh, all right, we've got some blanks. Let's do some blanks. Identify, this is application, identify the necessities and luxuries in your life, be honest, then begin selling and giving away your luxuries for the sake of the poor. That's an application you could choose to obey, if you so desire. Identify, I'll read again, here we go. Identify the necessities and luxuries in your life, and be honest, then begin selling or giving away your luxuries for the sake of the lost and the poor. Or for the sake of your brothers, your Christian brothers. I should put that in there too. Please don't miss that. Lost and the poor, yeah. And your brothers. Okay. This is 
is going to be a painful experience for you. If you really, if you really examine your life, if you take, um, what do you call that? If you take stock of your life, everything you own, everything that you indulge in, what is necessary and what is a luxury, what are the things that you want to keep in your life, what are the things that you need to keep in your life, and why, and you do that heart check, that is a very painful process because all that stuff that was coming up on that sheet last night, that's just going to come up. <laughs> that is a, oh my goodness, it's just going to come up. And then when you start looking at this, oh man, you're going to have to deal with more stuff with your heart and obey or, you know, figure out why you want to keep or not keep things. Jared. When you said that, that actually like really scared me because last year... <laughs> I had like a jacket and like I didn't really like it. I was like wanting to buy a new jacket. So I saved up money and bought a four hundred dollars jacket that I wore <laughs> like a month in winter. Yeah. And like when you said that, like things that are necessary and things that are just luxury, like I it like came to my mind that I don't need a four hundred dollar jacket. Right. And then you said sell it and I'm just like, Oh my goodness. <laughs> guys I know I just told you last night I, like we just bought we just spent 200 we blew 200 bucks on pictures <laughs> maybe we can sell them for a million bucks yeah and then sell it for a million yeah yeah very good um Okay, now, here's another application. I don't know if this is a blank or not. Then, based on your needs... No. Ah, oh, wait. Wait, then based on your necessities, said it said something. Okay, go, go back up. Ask. Um, do, I need do I need the house I live in? Or the kind of house I live in? Do I need the kind of house I live in? Yep, the next one. Do I need the car I drive? The next one. Do I need the clothes I have? And you, you could have a thousand other applications on that. Do I need the Netflix account? Do I need the video game system? Do I need the cell phone I have? Do I need the computer I have? Do I need the internet I have? Do I need, you name it. You go through everything, take stock of everything, and ask these questions. Then, based on your necessities, this is your next blank, set a simple cap on your lifestyle. Yep, set a simple cap or limit on your lifestyle and give away everything else. That is an application you could choose to obey if you want. <laughs> okay, next blank. No one, and I mean no one, is going to get to the judgment seat of Christ and have him tell you that you gave too much away. That is not going to happen to anyone. You gave too much away, and you should have spent more on yourself. Taking it that far 
trying to earn your salvation. No, there is no amount of money that you can put on the table that is going to earn your salvation. So it gets right back to the point made yesterday. This is about an internal trend that produces an external manifestation. Absolutely. Okay, so after last night, a question that kind of ran through my head was, do me and Leah need two cards? Should we, like, no, like, do we need that? Is that luxury? I don't know. Um, I'm just kind of wondering what falls in the line. I mean, that might fall in the line of food and covering, maybe. Or maybe it doesn't. <laughs> it's a really hard... So, John, just, would you say yeah. you, you like the cars because it's, um, it saves you time? I like them because otherwise it would be very complicated to so, get to and from. Yeah, and but what I was wondering is to what extent, like, if we, um, can we keep something, like, like for instance, work, having a car versus riding a bike. Okay, riding a bike, you, you, could, you could sell your car, buy a bike for like 20 bucks, and get them all that money before. Mm -hmm. But, now you are riding the bike around the whole time, and you have no time to serve the Lord in other ways that you could use to do. Right. And so, and like, unnecessary complication that results in the same thing. Right. These are the things that we must take stock of. So, so Jaden is taking stock. He's going, I've got two cars. Is that a necessity, or is it a luxury? Well, yeah, I suppose it is kind of a, a, a luxury, where I could survive without two, but what will the ramifications of surviving without two mean? Well, that would mean all of these areas I've got less time for. Well, are those productive? And is that going to produce more fruit for the kingdom and for my life? Yeah, because like if Leah's, you know, uh, not working one day and she wants to meet with a core girl or something. Right. It's like if she can't get to a coffee right. shop. That's a it's perfect like, example. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not asking out of a heart. <laughs> right. <laughs> yep, absolutely. You have to take stock of this stuff. I have kind of a related question to this first one. Um, for me, I would like to buy a house and pay it off as quickly as possible, mm -hmm. which means giving away less and just putting everything into a house until the house is done. And then I would. being able to get to work. Yep. Um, now, here's the. Here's the this is a heart issue and a conscience issue because that that idea is so alluring because your house is paid for. Ah, security. That's nice. Oh, and then, look, I could give more. See, I'm righteous too. I'm secure and I'm righteous. So just be aware of that. Not saying it's wrong. Not saying it's wrong. That's stewardship. It's good stewardship, but God does not look at what we do. He looks at our heart. You've got to go to doing it out of the right heart. Be aware. Take stop. Jake. Um, I was talking to my mom once, and uh, I had this thing in the mail, and basically it was a K. And she's like, well, you should probably start that. Yep. So this is a this is another conscience issue. Okay. Um, did four hundred one k's exist two hundred years ago? Four hundred one k's exist ever in history prior to two hundred years ago. No. The only thing we've got is how much now saving up money and storing it up in barns. That's that's existed forever. I hate money. Yes, I hate money. Anyway, <laughs> take stock. That's a conscience issue. Worth more discussion for sure. Jared. Oh, I'm just stretching. Good. Peter. <laughs> Good. Jaden. Guess the That's a good. Uh, I love that guy. All right. Here, here, here. Write down your question. Everybody's got a question. Write it down. Write it down. Write down your question. I kind of like it. I couldn't really write it down. 
Yeah. Okay, well, write down, jot down the idea so that we can come back to it. I'm afraid my computer is going to go dead here and we won't be able to get through it. Okay. Let's get through this and then we'll go to some more applications. So write your stuff down so that you'll remember. Okay. All right. Now, if we go back to uh, Mark chapter 10. Look what I did again! Look at that! Maybe that said the whole time I should have been teaching out of nine. Oh no! <laughs> Alright. Um, let's look at uh, starting at verse 21. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples, the disciples were amazed at his word. Jesus said, again, yeah, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. There's, there's some people, there's an argument over whether it happened as early as the year 900, but I don't think so. It's probably just 100 years ago, 1900. Anyway, there's this ant, this, this, um, analogy, not analogy, but a story that's told about the temple and the temple gate. Maybe you've heard it, where they said, no, in Jesus' day, when Jesus was teaching in the temple, there was literally a gate that was called the Eye of the Needle. Anybody ever heard this? Yeah. Okay. There's literally a gate. It's called the Eye of the Needle. And it is as it is, it is as hard for a camel to go through that than it is. It's harder for a camel to Easier. Easier for a camel to go through that than for the rich man to, to become the king of heaven. And so this wonderful sermon illustration arises out of that. The camel's got to get down on his knees. we got to pray to the Lord Jesus. The camel's got to get down on his knees. And then the camel's got to take the stuff off his back. You have to lay aside all your treasures and possessions. <laughs> okay. Okay. Wow. This wonderful sermon illustration arises out of that. God bless the wonderful. preachers that have used that unknowingly, but I'll just say this, it's not true, okay? There was no little gate called the Eye of the Needle in the, in the, in the temple court area. Never existed, okay? Not true. Um, what he is getting at is what did exist back then were camels and needles. And needles. <laughs> he was saying... He was not saying it's really hard for a camel to go through, but he could. No, he's saying it's impossible. You can't put this through that. It's impossible. Money on the table, table, we can buy our 
but he had a right to. We don't. Yeah? Um, a lot of times in my life, I've uh, feared a lot, um, especially as a so I've taken class at school, um, and in that class for seniors, we give like a current event every day, and so every day it seems like something new comes up, a killing, a stabbing, a shooting, a bomb, or a hurricane, or whatever it might be, and it, um, sometimes, um, Satan tries to discourage me about that, and, um, sometimes he, um, have the tendency to create images in my mind that are of the devil that make me fear. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, a verse I really like, um, is, like, I know Pastor Kurt talked about, you know, God is that sort of person where he is big and powerful and, and he made the galaxies and all this stuff, and know, what how and whatever. But then he's also this really sensitive person who wants to be our Abba Father, who wants to be close and sensitive with us. And um, I think the verse that stands out to me, um, um, like, um, we can, like, okay, sorry. Uh, starting at verse, it's in John 7, John 16, 31, and says, Jesus asked, do you finally believe? But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when you will be scattered, each one going his own way, leaving me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. And we can, like, apply that to here in our environment, too, because, you know, we can feel the presence of God even in this room with other people around us. And, um, who believe and have, have uh, a great relationship with him, too, because he's present here. Um, that's not in the Bible, but, like, it is, but it's not, like, written. <laughs> um, but verse 33 says, um, which is the key verse, I have told you all this, that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. And that is, it's, it's, um, it's like an, it's, it's a blessing to have someone who is big and powerful, but can also be sensitive and sweet to our needs. Day, yeah, there's going to be like a lot of trials here on earth. There's going to be a lot of things to hear you, but I am bigger than all of this. And like when we see these trials in the world and what's going on, it like when I was younger, I used to fear, or not fear, like I did that too, but I couldn't, I couldn't feel Jesus close to me. I didn't, I, I, I couldn't sense that that father figure that I was envisioning Jesus to be, I couldn't envision that because I couldn't feel his presence. And so I was, I was going to hide um, And so in this world we see all these trials and, we, and see, we're tempted to fear, but it's just evidence that, you know what, Jesus in the Bible is fulfilled. It's, it's evidence that Jesus is coming soon because he's like, soon when people become angry and blah, 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 and so, yeah, he's right. Very good. Um, <clears throat> here's a question for you. What happens, let, let's just say, let's just say for a moment that, you know, we talk about the Old Testament and how God gave wealth so that people would come to him and experience that great wealth. What happens, what's the, what's the biggest Christian nation on the planet right now? America? 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 I know, I know. Yeah, there is a rub there. But what if, what if, the thing that God wants in America to do, if we were to experience, if the church in America were to experience revival, true revival, where we ditched the American culture, and we decided, this ain't about American culture, this is about Jesus culture, the amount of wealth that the Christian church has in America, we could easily solve all the world's poverty. Am I wrong? Easily. If the American church were to use its wealth the way that we're commanded to, oh my goodness. We would change. We would turn this world upside down. Absolutely upside down. Think about it this way. Mark 12. We're almost done here, guys. Mark 12. Right now. Yep, write it down. 
Turn to the right a little bit. Mark 12, verses 40. through 43. Jesus sat down opposite to the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Jesus called his disciples to him and he said this, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into that treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. Ben? Would you say that, or do you think that someone in a third world country, Christian, who gives away their, like, small amount of money to help people in need, like, if they give away everything they have? Are they going to have like as much or a greater reward for that than one of us would for giving away the massive amount of wealth we have? Absolutely. Not a doubt in my mind. Now, um... Well, wait. What? Right. Who's this? Who's isn't, it, isn't it just a percentage thing? Like, if we get everything we had to live on, and we didn't get anything for ourselves to live on, wouldn't it be the same thing as someone in poverty giving everything to live on? Because then we would be in poverty? <laughs> The heart is the heart. <laughs> All right. Here is American Christianity. How many of you have seen the movie Blind Side? The Blind Side? That is American Christianity. Look at how rich we are. We have so much money. But we're so generous. We took in another athlete. He didn't have a home. We took him in and we put him in the NFL. We're so amazing. You're welcome. <laughs> That's American Christianity. That is American Christianity. Load it to the hilt. We do. We do. <laughs> we do. Yeah, we do. We do things, and then we're like, see, we're loaded here, and we're gonna be loaded there. Oh, it's everything. So we've got. Let's let's put it like this. Let's say you got ten million dollars. Okay. Let's say you got a really wealthy Christian who's got $10 million. And then they go, you know what? We're going to give away $9 million. We're only going to live on $1 million. Wow. <laughs> Come on. I'm not kidding you. Christians go, wow. They gave away 90%. That's amazing. And I'm going, I want to cuss at that, to be honest with you. Hey, what? Are you kidding me? You're living on a million dollars a year? No. I'm not praising you for that. You are not giving to your ability. Not even close to your ability. Try it with me? Okay, so that leads us to the question. Let's look at, I think we got blanks here. Are you giving... Let me see. disease. Like if they just had the medicine, they'd be fine. 
30,000 children die every single day. 60, since we've been here, 60,000 children have died because of starvation or preventable disease. There's no excuse in the church for that. Do you agree? Five, there's a little tiny blank there. Five billion people don't have Jesus. And what we could do with our finances to accomplish that goal, if the church turned over its finances to the Lord, we'd accomplish that goal. We'd reach absolutely everybody, like, in two days. It'd be ridiculous. So, um, okay, there's, there, there's the last thing. People haven't heard of Jesus. Um, don't, have don't, Jesus. Have. don't have Jesus. Don't have Jesus. Mm-hmm. Meaning they are not Christians. Meaning money can save people? <laughs> I mean, yes. Yes, I, I do mean that. Money can uh, the the act of charity and kindness and love is a powerful thing, an incredibly powerful thing. And the thing that they need is to see someone be Jesus. Barometer. Yes. Yeah. Every good calculator or guy can Derek. Oh, I was. Just, if, if the uh, I forgot what my thought was. Just along with his question, Josh's question, I can't remember what his question was, but I was just going to clarify. It's like, um, it's not it's not the fact that like everybody we know for sure is going to be a Christian that's not a believer now, the billion people. It's that if God did have those five billion or whatever we're going to be saved, then the American church probably could do that. So I, I think that's a very good point because I think in my mind at least there's a disconnect because we don't There's know who's all going to be saved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Joe. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Joe. Hang on. Hang on. <laughs> 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 he had his hand up. Go ahead. Well, this might take a little bit, but... Oh, boy. Inevitably, <laughs> when I go home <laughs> and I tell my parents <laughs> that I want <laughs> to sell everything I have, drop out of college so I don't have to pay tuition, <laughs> <laughs> and give all of my money to the churches in India, um, and live on like two bucks a day or something. <laughs> Ramen noodles. And my mom's going to tell me, Joseph, how are you going to provide for a family? And Joseph, that's not wise. Mm-hmm. Which just to clarify how it happened. It's like it's like every almost every single week or something, something like this happens. Yep. I want right. to give all my money away, and my mom's like, Joseph, that's not wise. And I want to do this, yeah. Joseph, that's not wise. Exactly. <laughs> 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 so <laughs> and I. Say, Ben Hunt told me. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> Kurt comes at me sideways. In my, <laughs> mind, in my mind, there's like this wisdom of my parents, and then there's like this truth of the Bible. And I, they're at odds with each other in my mind. Um, okay. Yeah, hey. yeah no, I mean, I respect my parents in it. Father and mother. <laughs> 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 I'm just going to move out. One mother or a hundred mother? Uh, <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to move out and come home with. And just fix the gospel on the street. And I'll give you a dollar when I see you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so.
tried to look around, I didn't see him calling people children much else than that. But in verse 24, the disciples were amazed at this words right after he said how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom. He said, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. It's like, why did he choose to call them children? I don't know if he looked into it at all, but... My, my immediate reaction is he was he was referring to his, his children. If you want to be my children, this is this is the truth of it. That's my immediate reaction, but that's worth that's worth exploration for sure. Okay. Um so yeah, so we've got this. Jesus ends with a promise. You know, he's like, Whatever you give, I'm gonna give you ten a hundred fold. If you give a dollar, I'm going to give you back a hundred. That's like, this is not a bad deal. This is not stupid. Okay, so. Um, right, which the persecutions are just glory anyways. Yes! Glory. Bring it! Ben. How does that hundredfold deal square with the nine million giveaway? Is it a good thing? Because what I'm saying is this this hundredfold is not guaranteeing you money back. It's guaranteeing you tremendous relationship. It's guaranteeing you tremendous other other Christian your Christian family. That you're going to have that a hundredfold is what he's saying. So it's not saying you get a hundred homes because you gave up one. No, he's saying you gave up one. Now you get to share a home with everybody because this is your family. <laughs> yeah. Everywhere you go, That's you are going to have a family. We can call we have room, it Rogers Road. We can live in the garage. Joe was saying, 
like giving away stuff like I have like a thing where like in moments I'll feel the need to like give stuff and I'll go overboard like when we take stuff to like Goodwill or something I'll give away so much like I'll be left with like two t-shirts and jeans and the shoes and I did that all the time so like recently like when all the hurricanes were happening I had two hundred dollars and they were talking about giving money you know to help so like I was like oh I have two hundred dollars I'll give away a hundred and I was gonna give a hundred to my mom and as I was about to do it my cousin like grabbed my hand and said don't do that and I was like why and she goes because you always do this you always give away too much and I said well, like I've never and then I thought about it and I was like I've never suffered for giving a lot of stuff I was just left with less but I never suffered Absolutely. and she's like you don't take care of yourself though and I feel like just people saying that a lot or like you shouldn't do this because you might not be left taken care of it leads me to like spend massive amount of money that I don't need on myself just to say oh I give too much and I need to spend money on me so then I buy things I don't need but then you tell us you know like children are dying and I have this like really expensive thing that I don't even use or need just I mean I honestly know. picture a, an orphan on your doorstep are you gonna walk past the orphan on your doorstep <laughs> to go buy pictures for your wall are you gonna do that if they were sitting right there, a baby needing life on your doorstep, and you just, that's kind of weird. <laughs> 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 you know what they care of your baby. <laughs> um, okay, so let me give you a few more passages I want you to write down. Proverbs 14.21 Proverbs 22.9 And then Isaiah 58.10-11 Yes, I will. All right. Uh, first one, Proverbs 14, verse 21. Proverbs 22, verse 9. Isaiah 58, verses 10 and 11. This will be the last verse that we read today. I'll read it. Isaiah 58. And if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. Okay? That's our fear, right? If I give, I'm, it's going to be a sun-scorched land. <laughs> right? So I can't give, because then I'm just, you know, whatever. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. He will strengthen your, your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. And there's more. Uh, what are the... Any other passages that you guys would like to add to this? I know there's the, the other passage that just popped into my mind is pressed down, shaken, overflowing. Anybody know which passage that is? It's like in the Bible. <laughs> All right. Well, that's just a thought. Okay, so um, I'm done with uh, my stuff. Here's here's the thing. I, I do. I would like to address... Um, Some stuff, especially like what Joe was talking about. What am I supposed to tell you? All right. Um, Stop it, Mom. Stop it, Mom. Hey, 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 hey. see? Is there a recording of that? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um,
<laughs> and all things show yourself to be uh, an example of good deeds, purity of doctrine, dignified, so it goes on and on. And then this other verse, 1 Timothy 5, 8. I think it's what Steve was talking about. Um, you know, give the list of things, prescribe these things as well, so that they may be above reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his of his household, he has denied the faith that is worse than an unbeliever. Yeah. So how do you Yeah, well, okay, that was the second half of my thoughts, is, like, this idea seems to work great for single people, but it doesn't work at all for married people. Okay, so. (laughs) 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 That's true. Paul did say, y'all should be like me, don't get married. Um, Yes, thank you for that wonderful um, bit of wisdom. Yeah, we do need to be sensible, and when it does come to uh, um, living as a a family and taking care of of our own, first of all, that is not a stewardship passage, that is a laziness passage. If you don't provide for your own because you don't have the manhood to go to work, you are worse than an unbeliever. That's what the passage is talking about. That is not talking about make sure you've got enough stored up for your family. That is not an accurate application of that scripture. Okay, So it is not just about single people, families included. Families included. Now, do I provide for my family? Absolutely. Are we generous? Absolutely. Everybody needs to. We're broke as a joke with a yoke of smoke on our... So, I'm broke as a joke, bloke. Uh, um, yeah. Anyway, so, so what I'm saying is, God is going to provide for a single person, and he's going to provide just as well for a family. Uh, would you also say that going to college would still be a good thing because, like, not necessarily, like, get the bigger paycheck, but it's like you get, you know, just in our day now, it's like you can't really get much of a job if you don't have a college degree. That's not, not true at all. Not? No. Oh. Well. Um, no, as a matter of fact, um, people with college degrees today typically, on average, are making less money than those without a college degree. That's so. true. <laughs> Now, I'm not saying don't go to college. I'm not saying don't go to college. I graduated. I'm fine. We're going to be on a stay at home life. Yeah. All right. Hey. Sorry. Got my degree. Um, I like a trust thing, too, where, well, if you say, oh, I'm in college, so I have to, like, save at least this much for tuition, I'll give the rest of it away. Well, if God wants you to stay in college, he'll provide the money for tuition. <laughs> So if you really trust him with your life, you can give it all away. And if he wants you to stay there, he'll give you a scholarship or like yeah, something else. Like <laughs> <laughs> no responsibility. <laughs> no planning whatsoever. <laughs> Steve. Uh, a book I'd recommend is uh, Hudson Taylor's Seven Spiritual Secrets. Uh, one of the exercises he did for, during college, they made him go out. They gave him a little stipend to go out, and they're supposed to hold an evangelistic meeting. And with that money, they're also supposed to give ten percent away. And then when they got back to her to repay the entire amount. So somehow God was to provide through that. That was kind of a, 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 a faith growing exercise in them. Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay, I have a question. Um the so I kind of received two things, like either like um the car accident, like some people pray and said, you know, God knew this was going to happen. Did he, or did he just, like, it happened and he blessed me through it with very, very minor injuries? Or, like, I guess the way that I perceive it, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, but the way that I perceive it is that we can choose our own direction and God will, God will bless it, like, if we, um, um, if we choose a wrong direction that isn't of God, He's gonna make us. He's gonna. He's gonna grow us through that through that experience, 
and make something beautiful out of something that is ugly. But I'm just kind of confused because on what Sarah said, because if we trust him to choose this for us and to go down this path and um, the Lord, then like. Okay, so yes, uh, I think I have enough to answer your question. Okay, thank you. Um, did God know? Absolutely. Did he allow it? Absolutely. Which means he meant it for your good no matter what. So he's going to choose all the future things that I, that I do. I choose to go to college if I... Or like, no. Because then no. I feel like it's not... Like, do we make our life... Like, sorry, I'm, I'm being... Loud. Uh, sorry, that's not the right word either. Um, <laughs> do we make our own decisions? Yeah, or does God direct those decisions that we make? Yeah. Out of, like, his, yeah. So, is, is what you're saying is that you would interpret what Sarah said as God um, chooses our actions by choosing what we're able to do? Like she said, like, God would provide a scholarship. That, like, we think, oh, I decided to go to college because I got this scholarship, when really God decided that we should go to college and gave us the scholarship. That's, you're wondering if that. And that's what you feel, Sarah. Is that what you feel, Sarah, saying? Oh, that's right. Oh, I have maybe a third. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, so, I, I, I do want to make a note here that this is a huge, big old giant can of worms that's going to end up when talking about predestination and Arminianism versus Calvinism. That's where this is all going. And, and I don't have enough memory on this. Okay, alright, so last count clarification on this point, go. Yeah, so God is sovereign and he can make things happen, but he also gives us two paths sometimes, and he says, if you go this way, I'll bless you, if you go this way, I'll bless you. And sometimes you might direct you down one, or sometimes they'll just say, it's up to you and I'll bless you either way, do your best. Mm. But, like, sometimes those two paths aren't what... Either one of those two paths aren't what we choose because we're tempted by Satan, so then we go down that path and he chooses. You can throw that in there, but either way, even if you go backwards down the path, like or whatever, I'm, not, I'm, like, I'm just saying that, that sometimes it's what happens. Yeah. Sure. I feel like there's just a lot of options in life. Like, <laughs> when you choose <laughs> someone to get married to, imagine if there was only one person for you and you had to choose that person if you didn't. Then you like marry somebody else and you just mess up the whole like plan yeah. of God. Like, it's over. Just yeah. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> it's like that. But imagine God gives you a circle of people and you can choose any one of them and they'd be great. Then it's harder for you to mess up. Right. You get what I'm saying? Yep. It's like okay, this. any other questions <laughs> on money? Money. We're talking yeah. about money, money and wealth and the theology of wealth. Yeah. Derek. I, I have a yeah, money comment. Good. Uh, just, just think about it in my head, like trying to, you know, everybody's different here, right? So like everybody's just got different things, they got different situations, different things, people in their lives, different families, different health situations, you know, all this stuff. And like, I just think in my head, like you have like all these people that are believers, just random, and they all have the same amount of money and possessions and everything. And they all give away different things, different amounts. See, Jesus, I think, would look at everybody individually, and somebody that gave way down here actually might not be as much as someone up here because they need a bunch of stuff to maintain their health or whatever. Sure, yep. So I just think everybody's got to look at themselves individually, and they can't look at everybody else. Let me, uh, I'll get to you in, in just a second here, Peter. The other thing, while it's on my head, because I can't forget to say it. Um, let, me, let me also say this, okay? This lesson is going to tempt every one of you to look around at everyone and judge and condemn them. Already done, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Get out, Johnny. Okay. <laughs> right. You'll walk into somebody's house and you'll see leather furniture and go, shouldn't associate with these people. They've got leather. Okay. So, <laughs> so but it might have been given to them. You don't know. It may have been given to them. All right. So let me let me finish my statement here. Um, this is all based on your conscience, and it is up to you to keep your conscience clear. 
It is also not up to you to demand something from someone else's conscience. I am not demanding anything from you here. I am presenting biblical truth to you and asking you to apply it to your specific situation. I am not saying that everyone here needs to sell all their possessions and give to the poor and live under a bridge and, you know, go from house to house and all that stuff. People had houses in the, in the New Testament. Paul traveled and stayed with people in houses just like Jesus did. Okay. Paul was a tent maker. That was by trade. So, um, so, do not go out into the world and judge other people. Don't judge each other. Judge yourself. Okay? Make sure you don't keep don't your don't conscience don't. clear when it comes to this stuff. I want you to take stock of your life and is this because I'm being selfish and leaving the orphan on the doorstep? Stepping over the orphan on the doorstep and going to purchase my whatever? Or am I keeping my conscience clear and giving and being a steward of, of everything? I am not saying that we aren't, in, we aren't to be good stewards of money. I'm not saying. I, I have given you the, the, the talks the last two days have been very one-sided when it comes to give it away, give it away, give it away, give it away, give it away. Give it away, give it away, give it away. Give it away. <laughs> that was bad, that was bad. <laughs> um, so, it's been very one-sided with that. Um, what I am saying is, you are not ever to find your security in money. If you are finding your security in money, you are sin. You are in sin. You are sinful. You are finding your security in money. I deliberately made you do these exercises to get you to realize, oh my gosh, I put so much security in money. And if I don't have it, I'm going to freak out. God provides for the birds, he'll provide for us. Peter. Uh, I guess there's a few encouragements for the warriors out there. Uh, story of George Mueller, you can look it up, the guy that ran the orphanage, always had God providing miraculously for him. Um, and my own parents, uh, my dad was a director of research, took like a 90% pay decrease to move to Indiana and develop transmitters um, to broadcast the gospel in foreign countries. And God has provided for our family. And uh, and then also, as a, this was just God working in my heart, and unfortunately my heart has gotten, some, I'd say, a little bit more uh, selfish since then. But uh, I was two years into college, lots of college debt, because it was a good college. And, uh, and then I was like, you know what? Uh, now that God's first in my life, because that happened, um, I don't think I want to do computer science. I want to go into ministry. And that was where my heart was at. And I was like, I don't care about money, but I have all this college debt, so I'm going to make this decision. Um, and I, I think I was okay with it. But finish my degree, work and pay off all my debt, and try to do ministry. And so I think you just take your decisions one step at a time, ask God where he wants you to go. And my heart was totally like, I don't care about money. I just want to do this ministry. And I think God loves that, and that's where he wants our heart to be at. Amen. Um, so, there's just a random thought that when you're talking about <coughs> the, like, when you get stored your treasures and you get a hundred of, like, everything you get, um, it makes me think about, well, what if you're just, like, doing that just so you can get a hundred? <laughs> so... Yeah, we need to be extremely, extremely cautious with why we do everything. Now, I, now, honestly, honestly, I think God, if He had a humble servant who could, who is capable of making billions of dollars and get it all away, God would want them to pursue that, you know. But the key is not this. I'm going to live on a million. I'm going to make $10 billion, and I'm going to be so righteous, people are going to worship me for only living on a million. No. Steve? Uh, Nathan, were you asking about the reward motivating you? Like, oh, God's going to give me tenfold, so that's all oh, I'm sorry. Is I'm going to get more. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Then yes, absolutely. Do it for that reason. That's, yeah. that's I, biblical. That's, that's kind of the verse I was going to yeah. share. It's like, uh, and without faith, it is impossible to please Him. The Lord will draw near to God. Must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. Yes, 
we are absolutely supposed to be reward seekers, just not here. <laughs> not in this life. We are supposed to be seeking. You're supposed to be maximizing our reward there, for sure. Um, I know you said this was kind of up to our conscience, but if we're trying to decide on our conscience, I guess, 401k? Do <laughs> 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 you have any thoughts? For you, it's a sin. For everyone else, it's fine. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there's, a, there's a song title that I've seen, 401kkk. 401kkk. <laughs> Okay, so, so here's the here's something that I've seen happen a thousand times to people. They put, they invest, 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 and then they end up with a million dollars, and then the stock market crashes, and they end up with nothing. Happens all the time. That's why God says, don't put your, don't rely on that. That is so, it can be taken from you like that. It's not reliable. The only thing that is reliable is God. Now, am I saying that you should not conscience. It's conscience. It's a conscience thing. Um, so, let me, let me put it this way. Let's give you, let's give you some examples. Okay? Steve. Uh, just an interjective thought. Uh, sometimes the reason people watch for their eventual, maybe, maybe I die and leave my family without me. What, what happens then? They're not able to provide without me or something. So, it's not having something and it's just a backup. Uh, so that you can leave an inheritance? Well, sort of. I, I mean, this, it's, it's not like if they'd be wealthy with it necessarily, but have something like they wouldn't have a provision otherwise. Like he probably sat home with debt or something from all the funeral stuff, and and they wouldn't have it like on bread anymore. anymore. So <laughs> they need money. Just money. <laughs> so like what you're saying is providing for your family is justified. Uh, then is saving for your family in the case of your death. <laughs> yes, I would say I would say that's a conscience issue, and it's not the same either. They're, they're all conscience issues. All, all conscience. Okay, so let me let me do this. Let me do this, guys. Let me do this. Please pay attention. Please pay attention. Here we go. I'm gonna give you a few examples. There is there is a extremely wealthy Christian pastor. Not gonna say his name. <laughs> Extremely wealthy Christian pastor who. I think it's in heaven. In heaven. Yes, what? 